back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about setting up your training principles and behaviour principles in an order of importance, where the most important rank at the bottom, then as you progress to the top of the list, it's where the least important principles are. Now, just because the principles are on the top of the list, it doesn't mean that it isn't important, but just rather that the principles below it should have more attention paid towards them. So I just want to explain the setup on the board because you're probably wondering why I've drawn a house. Now, building a house and building muscle are two different things, but they do have some things in parallel, such as for a house to be built successfully, you must have builders there in the first place to build it. The same goes with your training. You must be consistent in your training and turn up to your gym sessions in order for you to build muscle. Now, worrying about the colour of your lampshades in the house before the builders have been hired or the uh, foundations have been laid is the same as worrying about your tempo and rest periods before you've even been consistent in your training or paid attention to progressive overload and these other important principles down here. Now, as we progress through the video, I will be referring back to the house using it as an analogy when referring to these training principles. You'll get the idea as we go along. So I want to begin with the behaviour principles. So I want you to view these behavior principles as the planning permission for the house. Of course, you can build a house without planning permission, but eventually that house is gonna get taken down. The same applies for these behavior principles. Of course, you can start a training program about having these in place, but eventually, just like the house, you're gonna get taken down. For example, if you're neglecting your sleep and making poor decision making around your training and your motivation is low, and the chances of you being successful within that training plan is going to be fairly slim. You're just going to keep getting setbacks. So what I want to get across in this video is that these behaviour principles must be in place and aligned first before even worrying about the training principles. So let's dive straight into it. So beginning with the most important behaviour principle, we have forming good sleeping habits. Now it's imperative that you do this. Now it's recommended we get between seven and nine hours sleep each night. Not only does this ensure that our mental well-being is being in check, but it also makes sure our performance within the gym is going to be at its high. Versus if we were neglecting sleep, we'd see a big drop in performance. This is obviously something we want to avoid. Now to emphasize my point here, there was a study done where they took five subjects who were young, healthy males, and they reduced their sleep to only five hours per night. They did this for one week. And what they found after one week of sleep restriction to only five hours a night, that these young, healthy males, day-to-day -day testosterone dropped by 10 to 15%. Now remember, testosterone is an anabolic hormone. It's a key driver in building muscle. For us guys, it's important that we try to keep our testosterone in a healthy range. And like I said, our testosterone will fluctuate day to day for different reasons. But by neglecting sleep and not eating healthy and not exercising, you're only going to put yourself in a position where it's going to negatively impact your testosterone. So by obviously avoiding them three things I've mentioned, you're going to put yourself in a position where your testosterone should hopefully be in a healthy range. Moving on to routines and habits. Now it's imperative that you set up good routines and habits around your training. Now, an example of this is that I will pack my gym bag and get all my shower stuff ready the night before. I will even go downstairs and get all my breakfast stuff ready for the morning. And that does seem extreme and it probably is to be honest, but the implications of me not doing that means the next day is probably not going to run as smooth. If I haven't got all my gym bag sorted, then it means that I'm going to waste time in the morning and I'm going to be late running for work and just getting out the doors is going to be more stressful than it should need to be. The other implication would be that if I forgot to pack something in my gym bag later on when I want to go to the gym and train, if I haven't got all my kit, then that's going to mean that it's going to affect my training because I probably won't be able to train. So the point I'm getting at by just being a bit more organised and getting stuff sorted the night before, so setting up a good habit and routine, enables the next day to run a lot smoother and minimises the chances of your training sessions being missed due to being not organised. Next, fulfilment and enjoyment. Now, I personally believe that everyone should enjoy exercising. Now I do understand it's easy for me to say that because exercising is my passion, therefore I'm naturally going to get enjoyment and fulfilment from it. However, walking in someone else's shoes who doesn't enjoy exercising, I can compare this with me attending art lessons. Now, at this current time, I have no intentions at becoming good at producing artwork. However, if a friend persuaded me to go along and do art lessons and I agreed to it, the first few weeks would probably be shit. Now, that's down to me probably being shockingly shit at it. However, if I was to stick to it and start becoming a little bit better at it, I would probably start to get a bit of enjoyment out of it. 
And let's fast forward to yeah, if I was one of the best art producers in the class, I can guarantee I would enjoy it more and along with that enjoyment would come fulfillment. So what you need to think about if you don't enjoy exercising at this current time, that's absolutely fine, but you wanna try and anchor yourself to it to get the first few tough weeks out of the way. And when the results come, I can promise that you'll get fulfillment from it. Now, one way to do this would be hire a PT, hire an online coach, maybe even buy some new gym clothes, anything that may motivate you to get you in there for the first few weeks until you can start seeing some results. Because I promise you, when the results come, enjoyment comes and fulfillment comes, okay? So moving on to decision making. Now, we all do make bad decisions from time to time. I definitely have done in the past. I'm no exclusion to this. But anyway, the point I'm getting is that we want to make good decisions based around our training. So what you want to try and do is minimize any external distractions or influences that may push you away from your training. And this kind of links back to creating good routines and habits. Because if you have good routines and habits set in place, then it's kind of very automatic. Like once you get into a routine and you get familiar with the habits, it's quite an automatic process. So that also takes care of making good decisions in some form because you're just doing it automatically. You're not thinking about it. Whereas many of the times when you're thinking about it, that's where you may lead to making bad decisions. An example of bad decision making would be if you're somebody who trains in the afternoon or evenings, if you know when you finish work, you go straight home, that's gonna be very difficult for you to get back up and go to the gym. And that's probably a bad decision. You probably need to go to the gym straight from work or maybe even in the morning. You need to set up a routine that's best gonna support you because if you know for a while that when you go home, you're just gonna sit in front of the TV and snack, then the chance of you getting out to go to the gym later are slim. So you just need to make good decision making based around your training. Another example of bad decision making would be maybe going in and ego lifting i.e. moving more weight than what your body can actually withstand. This would obviously more than likely result in you getting injured, which would then have you having a downtime period, which is obviously not gonna be the best thing to support the goal of building muscle. So next, moving on to motivation. Now, some of you might be surprised that I placed motivation at the top of the list in the least important category. Like I said before, it doesn't mean that motivation isn't important, but I just think if you haven't got these principles nailed down here, then motivation probably is going to be at a low anyway. For example, if you're neglecting your sleep, then I can promise that motivation isn't going to be exactly high. Now, we all know this. If you've had, only had a few hours sleep the night before, then the next day you just feel groggy and tired and you're not exactly very motivated. Now, motivation is usually prescribed to people when embarking on any exercise or training program. Now, I think this is good, but like I said, motivation is at a high when things are going well. And as we know, life isn't exactly linear. We experience up and downs. Therefore, when we experience a down, motivation is likely to be at a low. So what I would suggest is that you want to get in the mindset of becoming dedicated more than motivated, because if you're purely just relying on motivation to get your training sessions done, then if your experience is low and your motivation is low, then it's not going to be a good tool to rely on. So instead, you need to get in the mindset of becoming more dedicated, because when things aren't going so well, dedication will still pull you through it versus motivation, if that makes sense. Just to summarize, I'm not saying motivation isn't important, but rather you need to be motivated and dedicated. If you have both of them tools in the belt, then you're more likely gonna stick to your goals long-term. So moving on to the training principles, just to remind you, the most important principles are at the bottom where the green arrow head is, and the least important towards the top where the red arrow head is. Now, all these principles towards the bottom should form the base of any training program. Now, what I'm going to do is touch lightly on what each principle is and kind of explain why I positioned it. I'm not going to go into great detail about each principle because we'd be here all day. I just want to keep this video fairly short. It's mainly just to get you to think about prioritizing the principles in an order of hierarchy that's best going to support the goal of muscle growth. So beginning with consistency, that's always going to be placed at number one. Because if you're not consistent in your training, then you're not going to be able to get the results. So it doesn't matter about any of these other principles, because if you're not consistent, they, they don't matter because you're not turning up to the gym. So it voids all of these other principles. Now, using the house as an analogy, I like to see consistency as the same as the builders. Without the builders turning up to the plot, the house simply doesn't get built. The same applies to you not turning up to the gym. If you're not there, how do you expect to build muscle? So hopefully you start to understand how this house analogy works. Moving on, we have safety and form. I've ranked this in position two. Now it's probably obvious to most of you watching that safety and form is important to reduce any injuries from occurring. Now some would say that I should place safety and form 
in position one. Now, I do agree, however, without consistency, it's almost irrelevant because you're not going to injure yourself if you're not going to the gym. We're not going to injure yourself in the gym if you're not there, if that makes sense. Now, referring back to the house as an analogy again, safety and form can be the equivalent as the health and safety officer being on site. Of course, the builders can go ahead and start the work about a health and safety officer being present. However, the chance of an injury happening later down the line is significantly increased. This goes the same with your training. Of course, like I said, you can use bad form and still exercise, but eventually you're going to get injured and then be off training for a set amount of weeks or even months, which is then going to have a negative impact on your overall goal of building muscle. So one thing about safety and form, think of it as a health and safety officer in terms of building the house, okay? Moving on to volume, frequency and intensity. These three should form the base of any training program, okay? Beginning with volume. Volume in its simplest form, in terms of resistance training, is the amount of work performed. Now you can calculate volume by doing reps, time sets, times the weight being used. So taking barbell bench press as an example, we could do three sets performing 20 reps with a weight of 50 kilograms. Now mathematically, that would look like three times 20 times 50. That equals 3000 kilograms, or kilograms in this case. So the total volume load or the total amount of work performed in that set was 3000 kilograms, okay? Now we could achieve the same amount of volume, so 3000 kilograms, but changing the variables slightly. So again, using barbell bench press, we could do five sets, five reps with 120 kilograms. That also equals 3000 kilograms. So we've managed to equate the volume, but just change the variables around slightly. Now, the important thing to note here is that even though volume can be equated, not all volume is equal. And what I mean by this, if we were to replace barbell bench press and replace that with barbell back squat, I think the results would be slightly different. Although the same amount of volume or workload has been equated for both sets, depending on what exercise you're doing can elicit different results. For example, if we used to switch the barbell bench press for barbell back squat, I personally think doing the higher amount of reps of a lighter load would be actually more exhausting than doing lower reps of a heavier load. Now that's just because typically doing more reps of squats just seems to be more exhausting than doing lower reps of a heavier weight. So although you can match the volume load, depending on what exercise you actually pick, may have a different outcome on the intensiveness of that set. So in contrast to this, we could match that volume load of 3000 kilograms by lifting a broomstick. Now it would take many reps to get to that point, However, if it was possible to do, would it even elicit muscle hypertrophy? I personally think it's questionable whether it would. I don't think that load that light would probably elicit muscle hypertrophy. I believe that you need to have a load that's moderately heavy taken to failure or just short of failure to elicit muscle hypertrophy. So this is just something you need to keep in mind with your programming. Uh, I think the weights that you're using need to be at least moderately heavy and taken close or short of failure. Now, it does seem apparent from studies that the more volume you do does seem to lead to more muscle gains. Now, although these studies have seemed to indicate this, I think it's still a gray area in terms of research because everyone's individually different, meaning depend on your genetics will probably have a big influence on how much volume you can recover from. So if you're doing too much volume and you're not recovering from it, then this is actually not gonna put you in a position that's best for supporting muscle growth. In fact, it may even be the opposite. Whereas someone else may be able to respond very well to a high amount of volume. If that's the case, then that type of training will support their goals, but it may not necessarily support your goals. So that's just something to keep in mind. So let's move on to frequency. Frequency in simple terms means the amount of times you train or the amount of times you train a muscle group. Now, an example of increasing my frequency would be going from training three times a week to five times a week. An example of me increasing my frequency or training a muscle group may be going from training chest once a week to twice a week. Okay, so you're just increasing or decreasing the amount of times you train or train a muscle group. So let's move on to intensity. Intensity often gets muddled up with intensiveness. Now, an example of increased intensity would be adding more weight to the bar. So by adding more weight to the bar or adding more weight to any exercise, increases the intensity of that exercise or that set. Now, people often muddle this up with intensiveness. Now, intensiveness means how hard that training session was or that exercise was. Now, a way of manipulating intensiveness may be short rest periods 
or increasing time under tension and things like that. Anything that makes the set or the training session more difficult in terms of how hard it was versus intensity, which just means adding more weight to the bar, okay? Now, the important thing to note here that by manipulating frequency, intensity will also affect your volume. So if you're adding more training sessions a week, and you'll add more weight to the bar, this is also obviously gonna affect volume. Because remember, volume basically means the total amount of work performed. So by increasing or decreasing these variables will directly affect your volume too, okay? Now remember, these are the key fundamentals to any training program, okay? So moving on to progression or progressive overload in terms of resistance training. Now this can be defined as increasing the stress gradually over time. Again, this is a fundamental principle behind any training program. Without progressive overload being adhered to, you're eventually gonna hit a plateau. When this happens, this means things are no longer gonna be going in a linear fashion, they're just gonna level off. When this happens, the rate of growing muscle is gonna slow down and your performance is gonna hit a brick wall. So it's important that progressive overload is applied to any training program where the individual wants to A, build more muscle, increase their strength or hit performance targets. Now there are many ways to apply progressive overload. For example, you can increase the weight, you can increase the amount of sets you do, you can increase the amount of reps you perform. These are just some examples of manipulating progressive overload that allows a gradual increase in stress over time, which will break free plateaus or just keep progressing forward. Now, usually most people apply progressive overload by adding more weight to the bar. Now, this is great. This will enable you to get stronger and keep moving forward to support the goal of building muscle. However, eventually it's gonna to get to a point where you can't keep adding weight to the bar. It's especially true for a natural lifter. When this happens, you need to think about manipulating the other variables such as volume and frequency as this will enable you to break through the plateau and keep progressing forward. Again, like I said, you can perform more reps or perform more sets. This is another form of progressive overload that will enable you to move forward without having to keep sticking more weight on the bar. Moving on to exercise selection. This was a very difficult one to place there because I do personally believe that exercise selection is very important because it allows you to get specific within your training. Now let's say that my deltoids are lagging compared to the rest of my body. And that means I need to program more exercises that hit my deltoids than I do hit my chest. So what exercise selection allows you to do, it allows you to take a look at yourself and identify your weak points. Now by identifying your weak points, you can take a look at your current training program and modify it to best support the goal that you want. So again, using myself as an example, if my deltoids are lagging, then I need to be programming deltoid exercises over chest exercises. So looking at my current training program will allow me to look at what exercises I'm doing and we'll see whether that's supporting my goal. For example, if I'm focusing too much volume towards chest, but my chest is quite well developed, then I need to decrease the volume in my chest maybe and increase the volume on any exercises that focus on the deltoids. Now, another important thing to note with exercise selection is that it allows you to become better at performing a specific exercise. So let's imagine I want to increase my strength on barbell back squat. Now, of course, I could do a different exercise such as leg press, which would enable me to get stronger legs if I'm applying progressive overload over time and all that stuff. However, for me to perform my best I can in a barbell back squat, then I need to practice barbell back squat. So of course, by doing leg press, I can strengthen my legs, which may help me improve my overall strength. But for me to lift the most amount of weight in a back squat, then I need to practice lifting heavy within a back squat. So this is just something to keep in mind, that exercise selection is important when wanting to hit a specific performance target or a specific goal. Moving on to rest periods. Now rest periods can be described as the duration of time you rest between a set, okay? Now, a lot of people will use different rest periods depending on their experience with lifting. For example, an experienced lifter following a training program that's aimed at increasing the intensiveness will likely use shorter rest periods. For example, they may only rest between 30 and 60 seconds, as this increases the intensiveness of the workout. Again, it also depends on one's fatigue resistance. Someone with a higher fatigue resistance will be able to have short rest periods compared to someone with a lower fatigue resistance who would need longer rest periods. For example, most beginner lifters will have quite a low fatigue resistance. So they will benefit from using longer rest periods, anywhere from two minutes to three minutes to even five minutes plus. Now in contrast to someone following a program that's aimed at increasing the intensiveness, 
If therefore on the program that's aimed at increasing the intensity, so add more weight to the bar, they will definitely benefit from using longer rest periods. Now I personally made a mistake early on in my training from not resting long enough between sets. Now this negatively impacted the next set I performed because by not resting a minute or two extra meant that when I performed the next set I was just too fatigued and couldn't hit my rep target. Whereas if I waited a minute or two longer, I would have probably, or I could even guarantee that I would have got another two or three reps out of that set. So what I want you to take away from this, I don't want you just following the standard rest period scheme, which tends to be 60 seconds or two minutes. If you're gonna benefit from resting for three minutes, then do it. Because if you're gonna perform that next set effectively by resting an extra minute, then you're gonna get more benefit from that than decreasing your rest period and messing up your next set. So I just want you to keep that in mind. So lastly, moving on to tempo. Tempo can be best described as a way of controlling the rate at which an exercise is performed. So it's referring to the amount of time a muscle spends under tension in the isometric, eccentric and concentric part of a movement. Now, manipulating tension could be something like increasing the amount of time you perform the eccentric part of the movement. For example, using barbell bicep curl, we can increase the amount of time that we perform the eccentric part of the movement, so the lowering part. This will apply more time under tension to the muscle, in this case, the biceps. So by doing this is a way to make the exercise a bit more difficult. Now, majority of people are stronger in the eccentric part of the movement, so it's a good idea to have negative sets within your training program. This is just one way of manipulating the tempo, which can help break a plateau. Although tempo can be manipulated, to make your training sessions more difficult and break through plateaus, it really isn't worth stressing about it too much. You really wanna focus on the basics and the basics are being consistent, using good form, focusing on volume, frequency, intensity, and making sure you're applying a progressive overload. These are the four main pillars of any training program. So you just really need to focus on the basics and repeat it. That's all it is. To build muscle, you really just need to focus on the basics and repeat it, okay? So worrying about your tempo, rest periods, is again the equivalent of maybe worrying about the curtains in the house before the foundations and the walls are being laid. It's just no point worrying about it if these main components are in place. So hopefully this video has helped you understand some hierarchy of importance when it comes to your training and behavior principles. Now, before I end this video, I just want to emphasize the point that make sure you focus on getting these behavior principles in place before you're even implementing the training principles, because these are all principles that are gonna govern your success rate within the goal of building muscle. So hopefully you found this video helpful. If you've got any questions, then please let me know and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for listening.